Hello, I'm Annie Graham Larkin, Executive Director of the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum. Welcome to From Princeton to Playas, Phelps Dodge from East to West with Dr. Katie Benton Cohen. Thank you to our program sponsor, the Arizona Historical Society, as well as our members and donors who enable the museum to provide free online programming and fulfill the organization's mission to discover history, explore Bisbee's past today. To learn how you can assist the museum in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit bisbeemuseum.org. On Saturday, February 24th at 11 a.m., the museum will host a free online program, The Influence of Bisbee's Miners and Mining Companies on Museums, with Richard W. Graham IV. Please visit the events section of the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum's Facebook page for more information. Then on Saturday, March 16th at 11 a.m., the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum will host the free online program, The Bisbee Massacre, with historian David Grosset. Please visit the event section of the Bisbee Mining and Historical Museum's Facebook page for more information. All right. Dr. Katie Benton Cohen teaches history at Georgetown University and is the author of two books, including Borderline Americans, Racial Division and Labor War in the Arizona Borderlands, which is a history of Cochise County. She is also the historical advisor for the film Bisbee 17. She is currently writing a history of Felp the Phelps Dodge family and company and will be living in Bisbee with her family while she's on sabbatical in 2024. If you would like to ask questions during the program today, please type your questions in the Q&A chat box and we'll gather those questions to share with our speaker after the presentation. Also, a link to the recording of today's program will be sent to all of our Zoom registrants later today. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Katie Benton Cohen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Annie. Um, and I should say that Annie was working at the museum years and years ago when I was completing my PhD dissertation and then first book, Borderline Americans. So it's really nice to have this long um, connection and to, to re-meet. Um, I hope everyone has a full screen share of my first slide. Annie, can you confirm that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh my goodness, don't call me ma'am. Anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know who's in the audience and how much you know about Plyus or the history of Phelps Dodge. So I thought that what I would do is offer a little background about where I'm coming from on this project. And I'll probably assume a little bit of cross knowledge of Phelps Dodge and Bisbee. Um, but I have found in my research that people know a lot less about Plyus. Um, which had a rather brief lifespan as a Phelps Dodge Company town, um, as well as the connections between the Phelps Dodge family, partic particularly the Dodge side and Princeton University. And I'll say a bit about why I sort of pull those together here. So um, this is just the opening slide um, that you probably all saw in the advertisements. I took this picture last summer on a visit to Plyus, um, in um, Hidalgo, New Mexico. Okay. Uh, oh, doesn't want to advance. Okay. All right. So the first thing I've actually put this out of order. Luckily, I will just switch them back. I want to tell you where I'm coming from, literally, because I think that's important to how I am approaching this topic. Um, although I am a fancy East Coast professor, I was actually born and raised in Tempe. Um, and um, my mother's family, um, my maternal great 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 grandparents, my mom's grandparents, immigrated um, from Eastern Europe, um, Eastern European Jews who settled first in Chicago and then moved to D Douglas by about 1907. Um, my grandfather was born there in 1913, and he grew up in Nogales in El Paso. Um, and this is relevant because I do have kind of family history that helps me think or gives me an emotional connection um, to this topic that I think adds a kind of curiosity in addition to my intellectual curiosity. Um, and then that shapes how I'm giving this talk today because um, I am a public school kid from the Southwest. I went to Tempe High and I ended up going to Princeton University, which was a bit of a... Um, 
culture shock for me, went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, lived in Bisbee um, for about a year when I was in my late 20s doing my PhD dissertation, have been back and forth a lot. And I'm now, as, as some of you know, and as the introduction made clear, living here for about five months with my husband and my younger son, who's in third grade at Greenway right now. Um, and I share all that because I knew that the Dodge family had gone to Princeton University, but as I began um, to conceptualize writing this history of um, Phelps Dodge and the Dodge family, um, which I decided to do after my involvement in Bisbee 17, because I went to a dozen screenings of the film all over the country. And some of those were with Robert Greene, some were with some other people, he's the director. And people at every audience all over the country came up to us afterwards and told us stories about their relationship either to Phelps Dodge, which I sort of expected, especially when we did talks, you know, like in Arizona, but also with the Dodge family and telling stories and them saying, like in one instance, um, a, a woman from New York saying, you know, I grew up next to um, their summer house, one of their summer houses <laughs> in Oyster Bay, Long Island. And I never knew that this family had this relationship to this fascinating place. And so I started thinking about how as an Arizonan, I felt so alienated from the East Coast elite of Princeton University. And then I found out that a great deal of Princeton University was actually shaped by, from a policy perspective and funded by the Dodge family and thus not so indirectly by, of course, the mines and smelters of Cochise County and New Mexico and Mexico and on and on. So uh, two of my best friends had work study jobs at the cafe at the Murray Dodge Hall when I was an undergraduate. There is a Dodge professor of history. There is a Dodge professor of Near East Studies, the geology department um, there was funded and created by um, the Dodge family um, and it housed many, many uh, mineral specimens from Bisbee and Clifton, which um, Princeton has actually recently returned. We could see it as a kind of repatriation to University of Arizona. And then I think what I found kind of most almost spooky is that my fall semester of my freshman year, I took a history class that sort of sold me on becoming a historian. And it was taught in the largest lecture hall at Princeton McCosh Hall, which I found out the Dodges funded. They were one of three families that funded this grand lecture hall. Um, so when I was conceiving of this talk after I went to Plyus, um, first in the summer of 2021 and again in 2023, what I was aiming for was to show the unbelievable contrasts created by Phelps Dodge and Dodge Money. The grandest kind of old school East Coast waspy wealth and prestige and then a from scratch, desert company town built as late as the 1970s and 80s, and then abandoned really only a couple decades later. And now, as I'll show, a training ground for special operations um, uh, with five model Afghan villages in it, um, where army rangers and the like go train. And it now billets uh, National Guard troops from other states that are brought here to be border observers. Um, and I'm, I, I'm still, the thing that is so fascinating for me as a historian is to really dig into the contrasts created by the manufacturing of great wealth and also great wealth disparity. Okay, so just to give you some context in the beginning of the talk, I want to talk about how, okay, first of all, I'm at Central School. Some of you are in Bisbee, you know, it's pouring down snow. I tried to show that. I have an old office chair that is sh shrinking. It's making me shorter and shorter. Hold on a second. <laughs> so if I suddenly disappear, it's the chair. Okay, so um, I wanted to, first off, um, really lean into the kind of life and contrast that the Dodge family had um, compared to life in the copper borderlands. So here I'm contrasting, um, and you can't, I mean, you can scroll in really closely, but um, some of you may know Cleveland H. Dodge, who was vice president of 
Phelps Dodge during the Bisbee deportation of 1917, um, was a very close friend, the number one campaign contributor, and a Princeton undergraduate classmate of Woodrow Wilson. Before Woodrow Wilson was the president of the United States, he was the president of Princeton University and the governor of New Jersey. And in all of those capacities, Cleveland H. Dodge was his confidant, um, advisor, and funder. And after Woodrow Wilson, just to give you a sense of the wealth here and influence, um, after Woodrow Wilson's presidency ended, Cleveland Dodge and a friend gave Woodrow Wilson a Rolls Royce as a gift. Um, just imagine this is, you know, the exact same era. Um, and of course, Wilson was president when the Bisbee deportation took place. Um, and in fact, I and other historians have sort of delved into the conundrum that Wilson faced, that his friend and funder um, was the highest ranking family member of a corporation that was part of the Bisbee deportation. And uh, Wilson was under a lot of political pressure to do something, which of course led to the federal investigation, uh, the Mediation Commission, but you can imagine was a very awkward situation for Wilson, but clearly he salvaged his friendship with Dodge who gave him a Rolls Royce leader. Um, another time, just to name an example, the Dodges are big um, yacht owners. They actually had a yacht called the Wasp, which I find hilarious. And um, they lent, um, I think their yacht Corona to Woodrow Wilson for a summer um, for him to uh, relax and recuperate from his stressful life. Okay. I also, and I, this is very timely uh, in the news. If you follow the news, uh, there's a lot of discussion about ending legacy preference, particularly at highly selective universities. And I just wanna point out, um, uh, and of course there was the ruling about affirmative action in universities. Um, legacy admission is a kind of affirmative action, of course, for the most privileged people um, in our society. And I wanna give us an example. Cleveland E. Dodge Jr., who was Princeton class of 43, his grandfather, Cleveland H. Dodge, and his great uncle uh, have attended Princeton. His father attended Princeton class of 09, Cleveland uh, E. Dodge. I hope I'll say a little bit about him. He's not well known, really. I mean, he's not as famous in this story, but he's actually really important. Anyway, Cleve E. Dodge Jr., who was on the board of Phelps Dodge during the founding of Clias, which is why I'm making this connection, was, let's be honest, not that great of a student. He was 32nd of 85 students in his class at Hotchkiss, which is a very fancy boarding school. Um, I love this college recommendation. The headmaster wrote to Princeton, quite honestly, he's not a strong student, but his work has improved steadily. Klee in his admission um, form, by the way, I got all of this at the Princeton University archives. Um, Klee wrote, I've never seriously considered any other college due to family connections. And then later, of course he got admitted, right? Later he wrote on a reunions um, form, um, one or more in practically every class in the last 100 years had contained a member of his family. Um, again, as uh, just a innocent little hardworking public school kid, this, this kind of legacy for that kind of, um, uh, to get into the school that I also got into and was really mind blowing. Okay, so I just, again, this is by way of showing kind of the contrast created by this family and by this company. So here is Cleveland E. Dodge Jr. Um, on the crew team, I think. Um, Okay, and then I kind of, so I bring up Klee because he, like I mentioned, was the last generation of members of the Dodge family. And there were a lot of extended families. So if I could go back here, um, the Osbournes and Rays were actually also on, very involved as officials, paid um, officials of um, Phelps Dodge in the early 20th century and also served on the board. So Cleveland Dodge Jr. and his cousin, um, one of the Rays, were the last family members to serve on the board 
of the Phelps Dodge Corporation. Okay. Um, and he was on the board at the time that Princeton, uh, I'm sorry, that Phelps Dodge decided to um, design Plyus. Now, some of you, if you are a Phelps Dodge history buff, know that Carlos Schwantes wrote a company history, Dr. Carlos Schwantes, who's a retired professor um, at Missouri, uh, in Missouri, uh, wrote, was commissioned by Phelps Dodge in the 90s to write in official corporate history. And Carlos has been, let me say what I'm doing is very unofficial, <laughs> um, but Carlos has been gracious enough to share a lot of his research and sources with me. And um, last summer I interviewed him and we were talking about Plyus. And he said that Len Judd, who was the PD, one of the Phelps Dodge officials um, key to designing Plyus, and there were a number of people involved, um, this is a direct quote from Carlos wrote, symbolism of power, bosses versus workers was key to Judd's plans. And um, I know I've talked to people that lived in Plyus and they um, talk about the very explicit class divisions in the way that the town was designed. Now, this should all be familiar to anyone that knows anything about um, Bisbee, Warren and Morency. But I would say it's worth noting that this happened even in constructing a town in the 1970s. Okay, so after I went to visit Plyus in the summer of 2021, and I will show you some pictures in a minute, it is in the boot hill of New Mexico. It is in a very remote area, even by our Southwestern standards. I got really curious about that time period. And so I went into um, Annie's Copper Queen, uh, the, the museum, the history and mining museum and looked through the annual reports. And Phelps Dodge came up with the idea of creating a new smelter site, the Hidalgo smelter at the Playa's town site in the early 1970s in response to, as many people know, increasing pressures about the environmental hazards, particularly of the Douglas smelter in the aftermath of the passage of the Clean Air Act and the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. And I'll just say as a historian, if you were my undergraduate, I would point out that these were passed under um, President Nixon's administration. There was a kind of bipartisanship about that that seems deeply nostalgic now, but is important historically um, because they had pressure kind of from all sides to adjust to this. Um, so they start writing about it in their annual reports. And so you can see, for example, there's the beginning of lawsuits in the late 60s. These accelerate, as many of you know. Um, there's a lot of local organizing um, of a variety of kinds, both activating uh, behind um, um, discouraging Arizona from exempting Douglas from EPA and State Board of Health standards, uh, local grassroots organizations, and then um, something I'm actually just researching now, um, I first gave this talk last summer, some of you may have seen it, but I actually just got back from looking at the Steelworkers uh, Union papers, um, which are housed at Penn State University, and begin to see the relationship between the union and environmental activists in the 1980s. So the point is that Plyus was designed and created at the time when these rumblings are really beginning. And I bring up Clee Dodge Jr. because Clee Dodge Jr. was, as he mentioned in his college application, interested in the College of Engineering at Princeton. He was kind of a tinkerer who did his own thing. He had his own company and he was always a board member of Phelps Dodge. But um, in other ways, he was sort of less involved on a visceral personal level than his father and grandfather had been. But he was very, he, he was a kind of an inventor. He was involved in applications for use of Teflon. He took a kind of engineer's interest in the design of the Hidalgo smelter. And so we can see a still maintained connection between the Dodge family and Phelps Dodge operations, which is critical to my book because my book is about the cross-section between the history of the family, their philanthropy, and the business. So all of these things I'm showing you right now are from annual reports. So again, if you know anything about the history of Phelps Dodge, we see economic uncertainty in the early 1970s. We see um, uh, 
you'll see Bisbee is shutting down. I know I'm going through these quickly. I'll come back, right? So this is the report about the end of Lavender Pit and Bisbee, the mine closure at the very end of 1974 and that transition in Bisbee, where again, I don't know who's in my audience. Some of you might have been party to this. Um, people either taking retirement or actually um, moving to other Phelps Dodge properties in some instances to Plyus. Um, okay, so I wanna go back here. So here is a notice in the annual report about the creation of Playa's town site, 10 miles north of the Hidalgo smelter. It will be a modern development of more than 200 homes and apartments, et cetera. So I just want to underscore, and what I would really emphasize is if I was talking to an audience outside Arizona, is that I think it's safe to say most Americans would have no idea that company towns still existed in this time period, much less were being created from scratch. Um, but as you know, um, Phelps Dodge had a long history of um, either turning existing mining settlements like Bisbee and Mule Gulch into kinds of company towns um, or building them from scratch, like Tyrone, for example. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, Bisbee shutting down at the same time. Um, and here is a notice, um, again, in the annual reports um, from 1974, about the construction of the Hidalgo smelter um, with a plan to be done the third quarter of 1975. Um, long story short, um, the smelter was prone to enormous cost overruns. It cost uh, double what they had originally um, hoped it had made it would um, cost. It also um, used a new kind of technology from Finland that the engineers were very excited about that they thought would be much more environmentally um, safe, fewer um, emissions, toxic emissions, but it proved to be very difficult to implement. There wasn't a lot of experience with it. Um, and you'll also note uh, that in this um, 1975 report, it's discussing the flash smelter, this Finnish smelter, um, the new town with more than 200 homes and apartments. And then following a long Phelps Dodge tradition, the creation of its own railroad, a 36 mile railroad linking to the Southern Pacific um, railroad system. And, you know, again, if you're a Phelps Dodge buff, you know that in many ways, Phelps Dodge was as much a railroad company for most of its history as it was a mining company. And Sidebar, that's another thing that I'm exploring in my book, particularly looking at the 19th century. And um, the railroad industry was really the industry, in addition to slavery, um, that pioneered modern accounting methods. So one of the things, one of the wonkier things that I'm thinking about in this book project about Phelps Dodge is the ways that mining, sorry, that railroad financing and accounting um, and shareholder uh, practices influenced um, Phelps Dodge as a business. It's a little different from what I'm doing here, but I'll just use that as a little aside. So I also wanted to show the ways that Phelps Dodge well into the seventies. And if you grew up in a Phelps Dodge town, you know this really emphasized the paternal side of what they were doing. And this was also, this was PR not only within their communities for their workers, but I would argue also very much a campaign meant to um, be seen by consumers and by Arizona voters about the important role that Phelps Dodge played in the Arizona and New Mexico economies. Here are pictures from the annual reports of the construction of the smelter. And this is a massive, massive construction project like I said, in the middle of nowhere at a time of economic uncertainty. So here we see them mentioning the adverse effects that EPA uh, programs uh, will have on their existing three smelters and why they're hoping that the Hidalgo smelter will be this kind of magic bullet of being a modern facility. that they've spent a great deal of the 200 million plus on um, emissions control facilities. And it's also the case, let's be honest, that the site 
was near the Mexico line in a very undeveloped area. And the hope was that frankly, there wouldn't be a lot of residents there raising red flags about air, uh, air quality. All right, now I just wanna um, switch gears a little to maybe the human side of this story. And I could tell a lot of stories and there might be people in the audience. I don't wanna speak out of turn about some great stories I've heard about uh, living um, in um, Playas. But I came across this cookbook, of course it has a copper cover, from Playas. You all can recognize these kind of community cookbooks. And, um, I found it on eBay. I have never found another copy, um, but this document, which I wanna write about just all on its own is really fascinating because you can see my post-it notes. Um, these are submitted of course by all local residents, um, almost all women, right? Um, and what we can learn from this as social historians is the kinds of food and backgrounds of people who were living in place but also the kinds of foods that they had available to them. So like other Phelps Dodge communities, they had a PD mercantile. Now recognize that that was really their only option. They were very far from other grocery options, unlike say a Marenzi or Bisbee, right? There was Safeway as well as PD Merc for, I mean, you all know that. Um, there also were a lot of game recipes and that shows us the leisure and also the nutritive um, value of uh, local hunting practices, um, javelina, um, uh, I haven't looked back. Oh, I actually have it right here. Hold on. Look, I have it. Um, let's see. Venison. Um, I want to say, anyway, um, maybe duck. Anyway, so I got really interested in, you know, what are people eating and, and how are they putting it together? And it tells us about life there. There's a whole section, this is the early 80s, whole section obviously of Mexican foods, not a surprise, there's also a diet section reflecting what historians are increasingly calling diet culture of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Okay, here we have a notice of the annual meeting of shareholders for 1978, again, to contrast the fancy world that um, boards of directors lived in and, and held their shareholders meetings um, in contrast to um, this remote desert town site. And they had their meeting at the Waldorf Astoria in New York. And here again, I'm showing you um, Cleveland E. Dodge Jr. Um, was named as a director to the company um, actually quite a bit before his father passed away, um, who died in 1980, I believe. Warren Fenzi, who was a longtime Phelps Dodge employee and very, very close friends with um, the Dodge family. And at the bottom is George Monroe, who was chairman of the board during this critical time. And if you know anything about the 83 strike, faced an enormous amount of um, opposition. Here we have a report um, on from 1978 um, on... Um, smelter production. And so we see a comparison of the smelters at Ajo, Morenci, and Douglas um, with the addition of Plyus um, uh, now up and running. It says that the flash furnace was shut down. Oh, that's bad, Dan. Oh, yeah. So they continue to have technical problems at Hidalgo. Um, they shut down for 42 days. Um, to rebrick and other major renovations. So it does not become the magic bullet that they hope. Here you can see the scale again. I mean, this is pretty astonishing. This operation is up and going about 10 years after this is really, there's literally nothing in this spot. All right, so what happens is that Playa's town site has a relatively short life. And like other Phelps Dodge Company towns, it is, a fully realized community that has Phelps Dodge built a bowling alley, several churches, a town pool. It, um, as a kind of sop to the county, um, put up a new rodeo grounds for the county rodeo um, as a way of sort of welcoming the community. It had a school, it had Phelps Dodge Mercantile, um, the usual accoutrements. Um, it had, as I mentioned, um, neighborhoods um, of highly different class divisions, apartments, as well as 
um, single family homes of varying size, depending on your status. When it was shut down um, in um, the late, very end of the 1990s, beginning of 2001, Phelps Dodge actually put it up for sale as if you would, you know, just put up a real estate sign when you sell your house and put the entire thing on the market for only $3.2 million, which is insane. New Mexico, who buys such a place, right? New Mexico Tech University in Socorro, which is not close at all uh, to Plyas, buys it for $5 million. And the uh, president of New Mexico Tech says, my feeling yesterday was simply evolution. Their hope is to um, reconfigure it. Think of the moment. This is during the time of the Iraq, um, Afghanistan uh, wars to reconfigure it as a national security uh, training center. Um, several years ago, now I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. Um, I did find on, online, and you can Google this yourself, um, shortly into its history as um, its new reinvention as a, a military training center, a photographer named Steve Rowell got in and was able to take um, pictures of the town site at this time. And his pictures are pretty incredible. I'm gonna share a few of them and then I'll show you some pictures that I took as well. Right, so people lived in Playas for about 20 plus years, that's it. As it says, it was abandoned in 1999. Here is a picture of an actual exercise happening. So they use these abandoned, empty company homes as training centers. Here is a, you know, probably a bomb uh, sensing drone, right? Um, using again, these abandoned houses as test sites. These homes, as you can see, were abandoned um, with full furnishings. Um, this is, just imagine this is a smelter worker's daughter's bedroom just left as is when the family left. This is actually a picture that I took when I went there in the summer of 2021. And I want to emphasize that the per particular context in which I came there was especially bizarre because it was after um, a year of COVID shutdown. And I wanna remind you that I lived in Washington DC, which was one of the most shut down parts of the United States. Uh, we weren't even allowed to leave New uh, Virginia, Maryland or the District of Columbia for several months. Our schools were closed for a full year and then only open two days a week. I had a pre-K kindergartner at home. I don't want to revisit that. Anyway, so I fled <laughs> to go on a research trip to Bisbee and to visit Playas in the summer of 2021. And so it was already a very surreal time. And I drove, I, I actually came to Playas from Morency and looped around to come back in Bisbee on about a 10 day trip. And I saw maybe three cars for a hundred miles. So this is me approaching Playas. Um, and these are some pictures that I took of one of the Afghan villages um, set up again for these military training operations. Um, the um, uh, airplane cemetery in Tucson um, donated um, some um, aircraft, Huey's um, other um, out of commission, um, uh, military aircraft um, to be used in operations. There's also been some movies filmed here. One of the Wonder Woman movies was filmed here. This is a picture of the abandoned Playa's pool. And that is actually it. I could probably pull up more, uh, but um, that is the end of my formal presentation. There's obviously lots I didn't talk about and I'm happy um, to uh, take questions since we have a lot of time left. Thanks. Thank you so much, Katie. And again, if you have any questions, please type your question in the Q&A chat box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And Katie, why do you think that Plyus had this interesting outcome as opposed to other Phelps Dodge properties? Mm. 
so I'm sure, I don't know who's in the audience and there might be retired Phelps Dodge people who'd know even more, but you mean about being sort of sold hook, line and sinker? Yes, as opposed to places like, I don't know, Douglas or other right. properties. Well, I think one reason is that it is, the only analogous one I can think of is Morency that is still, as you know, basically a Freeport Magmaran entire company town with the exception of what used to be say PD Merck, there's a Bashes there now. They have a little bit of private enterprise, but like their library still is paid for, their rec center, that's all owned by Freeport McMoran, the bowling alley, the motel. That's still really a company town um, and still in operation, right? So there wasn't, Aho was a little like this, but went to private ownership. I think it's the only one that was completely, totally Phelps Dodge owned. Right. We know anybody I think who's in this audience knows the kind of spectrum of control that Phelps Dodge had in various company towns. But this one was total. And I think that was the nature of they purposely chose this completely middle of nowhere site. And of course, the history of finding a smelter site is totally different than the history of, say, Clifton or Bisbee, where prospectors found mines first, right? And filed claims. It's a really different, you need a big corporate um, endeavor to make that happen. So I think it's the timing of it. And I think it's the fact that it was total ownership. There are examples, you read about them sometimes, right? Of like abandoned ghost towns, for example, that in California, that some investor will buy the entire thing. Um, in this case, it's just that the original owner had that opportunity to sell in that fashion and probably realized that they had this really unique thing. Um, so yeah, good question. I'm going to turn off my screen for just a second, but I'm still listening. I'll come right back. So go ahead and ask a question. No problem. Um, we have a couple of basic, um, uh, I guess you could say, Phelps Dodge history questions. Uh, the first of which is, uh, do you know when they first came to Bisbee? Oh, um, there's a lot of, here I am, a lot of, um, it's kind of this classic story that people love to tell. I'm actually writing about it right now. That's a chapter I'm working on in my book. Um, Phelps Dodge was primarily a um, tin and brass and then later copper trading company. They were already a very, very, very wealthy family in New York, um, even before their investment in copper mining. And if you remember learning about the Industrial Revolution in high school, um, it's the classic thing where they began, they, they were into some production, they had brass factories, um, and traded raw commodities, but they wanted to get into the production of those raw commodities. And a man named William Church uh, came into the Phelps Dodge offices um, in lower New York one day and said, hey, I um, own and operate this mine in the middle of nowhere in this place called Clifton. Um, it's 70 miles from, we don't even have a railhead yet. Southern Pacific was being finished. Um, and I think it's really promising. And I wondered if you would invest. And Phelps Dodge was normally the kind of business that would be like, no, that's crazy. They were very conservative, East Coasty, but for whatever reason, they were sort of entranced by this guy. And then Dr. James Douglas, Walter Douglas's father, had, um, they knew him through some investments that they did in Pennsylvania. Um, long story, medium short, they asked, asked Dr. Douglas to go look at this property in Clifton and also in Bisbee, which um, some prospectors um, had discovered copper in, in 1877, I think, 1879, um, Jack Dunn and some others, and there was the Copper Queen mine. And Basically, Phelps Dodge agreed to make investments in both Bisbee and um, Clifton in 1881 on the basis of James Douglas's positive reports. Does that answer the question? I believe it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and another um, PD uh, question, uh, history question is, do you know when they first owned the Bisbee Daily Review or Bisbee Review? I don't. I could look it up. And there's, it's possible somebody else, Mike might know that. Um, I see Mike Anderson's in the no, in the questions. Um, oh, and Christine, sorry, I'm looking at this. Um, I don't remember the year that they, um, early, but bought. And so I guess someone might know or could look it up. Um, 
I like to be facty. Um, but I do want to add that um, it isn't just the Bisbee Daily Review that they owned, right? It's actually um, many other papers in El Paso, Tucson, Douglas, Clifton. Um, it's pretty extraordinary. And I already knew that. But if you're in Bisbee or you're going to be in town, the antique store that's in the old bank, I can't think of the name of it. Anna, you might know, right across the street from the library. Yes, Miners and Merchants. Yes, they have a certificate from Cleveland E. Dodge. So that's Cleveland H. Dodge's son. And this Dodge that I was talking about, Clee Dodge Jr., his father, who I mentioned was very involved in the company in ways that I don't think we've fully accounted for. There is a certificate from the Associated Press that gives Cleveland E. Dodge full, you know, essentially um, uh, a certificate that he's a journalist who has AP credentials. And it's because of his ownership, not, I think of the Bisbee Evening Ore. You can go, it's literally in there. It's just very expensive, so I didn't want to buy it. But it shows like, here is this guy who is this rich East Coaster. In no way is he a newspaper man, but he controls the newspaper, right? He, this is another aspect of his um, experience. So I just want to say that's an artifact you can go see on Main Street today to show the extent of Phelps Dodge's involvement in owning newspapers. The next question is, uh, do you think that the failure at Playas and Hidalgo had anything to do with the disappearance slash merger of Phelps Dodge? Ooh. Only indirectly. There's a there's some years between those, and I don't want to get over my skis. Um, I don't know that you could connect the dots between the two. Um, I'd have to think about that, Mara. I mean, certainly it was a factor. It would be interesting to see what the net loss ended up being of the Hidalgo experiment and whether... Um, you know, I'm not an economic historian. I would have to have someone help me figure out, you know, the relative cost in multiple ways of the closure of the Douglas smelter and, you know, Hidalgo and whether Morency, you know, the Morency smelter is still a huge going concern, right? Um, so I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I will say off of the topic of the Hidalgo smelter, and someone like John Acosta would probably know the answer to that question. Um, one of the factors that we don't think about in the merger of Phelps Dodge and Freeport McMoran is that, and I say this, I taught for two years at, sorry, four years at Louisiana State University during Katrina. Freeport McMoran was based, was a gold mining company that was based in New Orleans and left New Orleans the year after Katrina, which was an absolute betrayal of New Orleans, which had very few corporate presences. And that was one of the biggest. And they were really seen as traitors for leaving New Orleans in its time of need. And that did shape the decision to essentially swallow up Phelps Dodge and Freeport change its headquarters from New Orleans to Phoenix. And I'm sure many people in this audience know it was rather a surprise to many people that it didn't go the other way around, that free, or that the company didn't become Phelps Dodge instead of Freeport McMahon. Um, so that's off the topic of Hidalgo, but a factor that personally matters to me that I don't think is emphasized enough is that Hurricane Katrina actually had an impact on that sale in some important ways. All right, I have a couple of questions regarding economics now. Okay, I don't know. I should have done my homework before this, yes. <laughs> Um, could you describe Phelps Dodge's economic impact on the New Mexico borderlands? Is the first yeah, that was from Mike, right? Um, at some point for the book, I'll probably give you actual numbers. Uh, what I can tell you, so New Mexico in particular or just the region in general? It looks, he said just New Mexico borderlands. Oh, it's got to be huge, but I've never measured it. But it wouldn't be too hard to figure out, Mike, because we could look at, for example, tax revenues. Um, in Southern New Mexico in the years of Hidalgo. And I think we would see a huge leap if we wanted to go look at, for example, County Board of Supervisor minutes 
or um, county tax assessments and economic measures, it would probably be pretty easy to track the huge impact that it had. I mean, that's a lot of really important jobs, right? And people coming into where there was literally no one. Um, so I don't have the answer at hand, um, but I'm sure that I will find it out before I publish the book. And the next question uh, along those lines is, is there a correlation between PD stock prices and the closure of Playas? I don't know. I'd have to look. I haven't gotten that far. Um, it's a really good question. I'm sorry that I keep saying I don't know, but that's, I think, the ethical thing to do. But these are all things we could find out. These are good questions. And when I, I haven't written the chapter on Playas, I certainly would want to look at those things. Yeah. You could also find them in the annual reports. Um, but of course, causation and correlation aren't the same. We wouldn't know exactly. It's very complicated too, of course, because um, Phelps Dodge's history through the 80s and 90s is pretty complicated by plummeting copper prices during the year of the strike in the 1980s, which is what prompted in some ways, right? The, the, the impasse between the union and Phelps Dodge before the 83 strike the rise of foreign competition and state-owned mines in Chile, which just in the same time period, but I didn't mention in the talk because it's not directly related to Plyus, something that's very interesting that's going on if you read Phelps Dodge's annual reports, which you can walk into Annie's library and do, um, is that those reports, you know, the nature of annual reports is to be very, not neutral, but apolitical in a way, and they become very aggressively political about what Phelps Dodge officials see as extremely unfair competition from state-owned collective um, socialist governments, mines in Chile, and their argument that the United States is actually subsidizing those enterprises by supporting the IMF and World Bank um, policies that allow those to happen. And so, um, there's a lot of foreign policy and trade policy that gets involved in this. So it'd be a little hard to separate individual causes, if you see what I mean. Definitely, definitely do. And we have a couple of comments from uh, Bisbee historian and, and mining historian, Gary Dillard. Oh, hi, Gary. <laughs> he says, for many years, uh, PD did an annual economic analysis of Perfect. impact on Arizona and New Mexico aimed at the public and politicians. And then his other comment is the only remaining U.S. smelter in the Freeport uh, McMoran portfolio is Miami, Arizona. Oh, it's Miami, not Marenzi. OK, thank you, Gary. And of course, Miami, that was, that's another instance of a town that was never a pure company town, right? And changed ownership to Phelps Dodge and then Freeport, as Gary knows. Thank you, Gary. I would definitely look into those. And the next question, it looks as though it's regarding Plyus. Mm -hmm. And uh, Milo says, I'm counting 200 or so homes on a Google map satellite view. Wow, cool. I, I also see about six cars on the entire property. Did they ever fill these houses and who's there now? They did fill the houses and the people that are there now is a small portion. I don't have the exact number. I'm going to go visit again this spring. I'm roping Annie in. Um, about, I want to say when I visited in the summer of 2021, I think they told me, I want to say something to the, to the effect of 50 houses have been refurbished enough to house people. And they use those for billeting National Guard troops, mostly. They'll also house people that are there for exercises for a few days, right, if they're coming there for training. Um, but like I said, they use them for housing um, for people who are billeted, they're billeting them for um, National Guard troops from other states. Um, which, <laughs> can I take a picture out of my window to show the snow? Yes, I can in just a second. Um, they, but then the rest of them are abandoned. They have in mind refurbishing more and they probably had refurbished more from the summer of 21 to 23, because I can tell you 
in the summer of 21, while they were obviously reopened, it was still COVID era and it was very, I mean, it's quiet there regardless, but it was very quiet there. And there was a period of time when it was shut down, when they literally only had this guy named Freddie, who's like 6'10", he's six a million, who works in the guard tower and basically lived there by himself 24-7 for years. And I would just say um, that he um, was a little wacky because of it. Um, when I came back um, in the summer of 2023, it was much, much busier there. And in fact, I went with three other people. One of them, uh, I went with Lori McKenna and Boyd Nickel and a couple of friends of mine, one who teaches at UTEP. And there were lots of groups of law enforcement from all over the country that were there doing trainings. And so I know that they are refurbishing more of the houses for housing, um, but many of them they're not refurbishing because they use them for training exercises. And Does that help? Yeah. Oh, I think so. <laughs> and how can you visit Plyus or can you visit Plyus at all? Oh, I love that question. Yes, they. I did not need to do anything special to visit. They will let anyone come visit. They have a public information officer who's very friendly. You can email them on their website and they do tours. And I highly encourage you to see it because it's like no place I've ever been. Uh, yeah, no, they basically, they are open to the public. I mean, there's certain places they won't take you, uh, but yeah, they are open to the public. And our last question from Mike Anderson is, will you be mentioning the impact of Pius on the Animus football team? <laughs> you know, I'm sure it did have a big effect. And that's actually one of the points that I make, right, about... Um, about what it meant to that community. I don't know if that's going to make the cut on a very big project, but I hear you as the sister of someone who played Arizona public uh, high school football. Yeah, no, and that has been mentioned to me, Mike. Um, someone wanted to see the snow. Hold on. I'll turn off my screen for a second. Is that all right, Annie? And then I'll oh, bring it back. Of course, it's a beautiful day out there. It's special, as you know. Actually, I'm, uh, hold on. I will be right there. I just don't want you to feel seasick. Gary, I'm so glad you're here. We'll have to get together. All right, let's see. Oh my God, it snowed a lot just in this hour. Here we go. Can you see? We can see a little, yeah, on, on the rooftops we can. Yeah, the roofs yeah. have a lot of snow. Look at that. Yeah, oh my, yeah. wow. Yeah, that's out of the back of, um, Central School. So looking into the gulch. All right, I'm gonna turn back on. All right. Well, Katie, thank you so much. We also received comments in the Q&A of deep appreciation for your time and expertise this morning. And we just truly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to share uh, your, some information with us today. I'm going to share my email at the bottom because I saw someone here who said that they lived in Plyus and I love, I've been able to talk to a few people who lived in Plyus, but I love to. This is my work email I'm sending out to everyone. Please feel free to be in touch if you're being polite and I got stuff wrong. You can completely write to me and say so. Um, I'm just looking at anything else. Um, anyway, I really... Yeah, please be in touch. Um, and I am in Bisbee through the end of May. I'm giving a talk on the British side of the family on Tuesday at 5.30 at the Copper Queen Library. And I also have open office hours the last Tuesday of every month through April um, at four. You can just pop into the Copper Queen Library and come see me and talk about whatever you want. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for letting everyone know about that. And yeah, and again, I, I'm trying to be as available as possible. And I know that there's so many people here who know so many things. So thank you. Well, that was in incredibly generous of you. Thank you. And, and I'll be in touch regarding a, a talk for the British side of the family, maybe in the uh, next few months or so I'll harass okay. you again. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. And again, thank you, Katie. We hope to see you all back on February 24th at 11 a.m. for our next online talk with Richard Graham IV. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye.